Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is video three, where we'll be covering uh, using kit plates and uh, typically resuspending the DNA from those kit plates. I'll also be going into petri dishes and how to make them, uh, how to pour them, uh, and also a little bit into making the broth that you use to pour those petri dishes. Of note, I have removed the screening section that is going to be included in a later video. I wanted to keep this video pretty short, so uh, just keep that in mind in the, in the later videos we're going to be covering screening. Okay, so uh, using kit plates. Uh, kit plates are the storage units for the iGEM parts that we get from the registry. I touched this a little bit last time. Uh, it's where all the parts are located in the wells. Uh, as you can see here, th these are the kit plates. They're stacked up. Uh, they have a foil covering, and they're typically found in a bag within the, the iGEM kit contents. So uh, every year we get a kit, I guess every year if we are an official team, uh, we get a kit that is filled with a bunch of goodies. Uh, one of those things are the kit plates. Um, those are what costs the most, I would say, because there's many, many different types of uh, synthesized biological parts for E. coli within those. Uh, it also comes with a few kit contents that include HR goodies, uh, some information, some pamphlets, uh, what maybe like some requirements for a competition itself. And it comes with uh, some DNA and some cell tests. So like sample DNA that we can use to test whether or not our cells are working efficiently. It may come with DNA ladder. Uh, there's a bunch of miscellaneous stuff. It typically changes per year though. Um, like I said last time, these kit plates come with a variety of different parts. Some of these parts include promoters, uh, some include reporters, some terminators, and product or coding sequence genes that can do uh, pretty much anything that you can find in a biological organism. So kit plates, uh, actually using them though, because you see like this is just this is just detailing what they are, right? We want to know how to actually use these things so you feel comfortable with extracting the parts and being aware where the parts are located within these kit plates. So uh, each kit plate, uh, if you pull it out of the bag, is going to be labeled with a date and a number. Typically, uh, you want to work with kit plates that are closer to the to your in, uh, in real life date. Uh, so if you're if you're working with a kit plate in 2021, you're going to want to, I would say the, the lowest you want to go is 2019, because although these things, these, these parts are dried, they do expire over and, and degrade over an extended period of time uh, due to light or, or due to other things like uh, chemical, chemical. And uh, we have spores uh, in the basement of shrink that may, may cause the degradation of, um, of our parts. So keep that in mind, uh, go for close dates uh, and then, also pay attention to the kit plate number. So uh, last video recording, I mentioned when you clicked on the part of interest and clicked get this part, it brought you to another page where it gave a bunch of information with regards to where it's located in the kit plate. One of the things it gives in regards to location is the kit plate number and the date. And the other thing it gives is the actual like physical location in the kit plate, which you have to label yourself. So say we have a part, uh, it's located in kit plate three in 2019. So we pull out the kit plate three part, make sure it says 2019 because it changes per year. And uh, we, we are given a number and we are given a letter at which it is located within this kit plate. But we don't know, because it's not labeled, we don't know where, which, which well it is. So we have to do the labeling ourselves. Luckily, iGEM gives a guide for this on their kit plate protocol on their webpage. Um, but I included it here too. So if, if you notice that there, these kit plates have a sort of a rounded bezel at the bottom. And so that's how you orient the kit plate. So the rounded bezel is, is here. Make sure this sharp corner is at the top. And so from the top, you, you work your, your way outwards, going down, um, of course, short side to long side. You do A, B, C, D for each of these little squares. And then um, left to right, you do one, two, three, four, uh, all the way down. And so this gives you sort of like a multiplication table, how to how to characterize which which uh, which which square you want to decide which part is in which with is it is within which square. That was complicated to say. So um, say you want like C two, you go to C. So this is the the C row, and then the column two is right here. So that would be C two. 
And that's how you label and orient apart. Funnily enough, these kit plates actually do have labeling, but it's underneath the foil wrapping, so you can't see it. It doesn't make much sense to me uh, because you have to do the labeling yourself. I guess if you're very careful, you could remove the foil, the foil labeling, but we just, we just do this instead. So actually using the kit plates once you have them labeled. Um, I'm apologize here. I'm going to pretty much just read off the slides entirely. So uh, step one, you're going to locate the well. So go to the web page, find out what the part is and where it's located. Uh, using, of course, your labels and the identifier from the registry. Then you're going to punch a hole into the well foil with a pipette tip. So you're going to get your pipette, make sure it tips on it, and you're just going to punch a little, little hole in the top of the well. After that, you uh, get some milliq or some distilled water. We have that readily available within our lab. Um, and pipette 10 microliters of distilled water into the well. Um, so you just put it back into that hole you just created and uh, you pipette it down. If you're not sure uh, what pipettes are or how to pipette, um, the lab training course goes into that. And also if you come into lab, the lab manager will be happy to, to show you how to pipette um, because it's one of the, the best skills you can learn with an iGEM. After you put that pipette in with the water, you pipette up and down a few times, and then uh, you pull it out, make sure no, no, none of the substance is left within the pipette, and then let that sit in its well for about five minutes. And we do this in order to make sure that all the, the, sub, the, all the part that may be dried and stuck to the outside of the well gets properly mixed in with the, with the water you just pipetted into it. And when it's done, it should have a reddish to orange color. That's because they include dye within the DNA. And that's just so you can make sure that you actually have a part within that well. It, now, if it's a different color, if it's, if it's very, very yellow, that means that some either some light degradation or some chemical de degradation occurred. So you want to probably choose a different kit plate or a different part to work with because that part may not work if you, if you start like ligating it and, and cutting it. And so actually like working with it through our protocols. And so, yeah, after you have it, um, let it, let sit, let it sit and let it do all the, the reddish orange color and you see it's, it's properly prepared. You can finally get out another pipette tip because you threw the old one away and pipette that part out and put it into an epi tube. We have epi tubes also uh, readily available. They're just little, little tubes that you can insert your gene or insert your part so you pipette it out, put it into the epi tube, and then you can use that part uh, for mini preps or for really anything uh, with regards to the protocols that we have for iGEM. Uh, just keep in mind though, you do, now that you've that now that you've resuspended it, you do not want to leave it out in the open environment where the light is or where it's like room temp. Uh, you want to slow down the kinematics and you want to keep it away from the light. So we have a freezer in our lab. Uh, put that epi tube, of course, label it with the part and date at which you pulled it out. Uh, we have a label printer that you can use, or you can just use a marker and write at the top of the epi tube. And make sure to put that in the lab, uh, the lab iGEM freezer so it can store properly and so it doesn't degrade. Next, I wanted to hit Petri dishes, uh, specifically Petri dishes with lysogeny broth or LB broth, because there are many different types of Petri dishes out there like uh, horse blood, uh, blood, blood agar Petri dishes. So what we're using is predominantly lysogeny broth um, or LB agar petri dishes. So in our lab, plates are used to grow E. coli, our bacteria, and um, they can't just grow by themselves, right? Because they don't, they don't have any nutrient value. So we have to add some sort of nutrient medium to these plates that's solid that we can spread the bacteria on um, with or without antibiotic. If, if you're going with antibiotic, typically you're, you're screening the bacteria that you're putting on the plate. So if the bacteria have a resistance gene to that antibiotic, they'll grow. So only, only the bacteria that you want will grow on the, on the antibiotic plate. Alternatively, if you just want to pretty much grow anything or just to see as a control if, you're, if, if your cells were alive to begin with, You'll, you'll use a LB agar plate without any antibiotic and see if it grows on the plate. If it does, great, your, your bacteria weren't dead and um, they're working properly. And if, uh, and even like some of them might, be might not be transformed, but some of them might be transformed properly. So if you're, if you're transporting with a, uh, transforming with a reporter gene, you might even see some, some red color pigment or whatever chromoprotein that you're working with in the, in the, uh, kit plate with antibiotic or even the kit plate without antibiotic. 
And so what we fill these up with, uh, like I said, lysogeny broth, um, agar, so pretty much just jello, is used as the main substrate. So it's what uh, solidifies the broth in order to uh, make it solid so you can spread it. Uh, other miscellaneous ingredients for this that make the lysogeny broth are yeast extract, um, salt, and triptone. Yeast extract is just uh, dead yeast cells that the bacteria can eat in order to get the nutrients that the yeast used to have. Uh, salt, uh, just to, I guess, lower the salinity, or I guess, increase the salinity of the solution. Um, and then triptone is a mixture of different amino acids and different uh, nucleotides so that the, the bacteria can adapt them and grow properly on the nutrient medium. Uh, here are a few pictures. So uh, we have a big box of empty plates that you can pull from if you're making the plates yourselves. Um, some teams just buy plates pre-made. Uh, they come refrigerated. You can buy them from many, many different companies. But uh, we make our own plates because uh, we're not, we're not, we're not like extremely rich. So we we make our own plates. Um, these plates are are smaller than these plates, but typically we'll use the medium sized plates. So these right here. We do have uh, large plates though. So if you want to do a, a humongous culture or uh, use use these big plates for better diagnostic purposes, we we have these readily available too. And so of note here, um, this this taller parts, the base. This is where you're going to be pouring in the molten LB agar broth. Um, and you typically fill it up to about halfway. And then this is the, the lid. So um, you, you cover it with that and you want to keep it as covered as much as possible. So uh, foreign particulate matter floating throughout the air doesn't get on your, get on your Petri dish. When it's solidifying, um, make sure to keep the lid on top. But once it's solidified, you actually want to flip this. So it's going to be upside down. Um, as you can note here, the agar's on the top, and then the the lid's actually on the bottom. And that's because um, condensate or con like water condensate's going to form on the on the on the top of the LB agar medium, and that condensate's not good for spreading bacteria or even creating bacterial cultures. So we want that that condensate, the water, to uh, exit or at least go on the the lid, so it doesn't harm the the agar that you're working with. Also, just um, keeping agar wet constantly is a great way to uh, either liquefy it or get it infected with various contaminants. So we want to keep those as, as uh, suitable, but as dry as possible. Also notice here that the, not the plates themselves yet, but the, the, the bag that they're located in once they're poured is labeled. So I have the date that which I made those plates. That's very, very important because these plates expire. So you want to use this date to figure out if your plates are expired or not uh, and when you should stop working with them. I also included one antibiotic written on it. That's canamycin. It's a certain type of can uh, antibiotic. It's a very popular one that we work with in lab. Other antibiotics include for, uh, chloramphenicol or like ampicillin. I also included what it is or what type of medium support on these. So LB agar, so lysogeny broth agarose. And then um, plates, just to symbolize that they're plates. Due to 5S, which is a um, like an organizational structure, we have color codes within our lab. Um, each like LB, agar, and antibiotics all have different color codes. And so um, you can barely see it here, but there is a yellow line right here that corresponds to, I believe, uh, LB. And then agarose is purple. And then the three, the three black lines symbolize canamycin. So always when you're when you're doing labeling on plates or uh, labeling uh, on on like a broth or something like that, make sure that you you not only label with the name of what you're working with, but also the color code. And don't worry about memorizing it. We have a it's it's found in a lab manual. The key to this, and also we have a a little poster that's put up in the lab where you can, uh, if you don't remember, you can figure out what it is. So next, I wanted to briefly cover making Petri dishes. I don't want this to carry on too much longer. Um, so these are the different ingredients that we have for Petri dishes. This is the salt, the agarose, the triptone, the yeast extract. And this is typically the size of the bottle you're going to be making this uh, Petri dish with. You're also going to need some misc utensils. So you're going to need uh, your, your stirring rod or, some, or a measuring rod. You're going to need your weighing boat. And you're also going to need uh, some sort of magnetic stirring rod. You're also going to need the, the stirrer, which is uh, the magnetic bead. It goes to the stirrer. 
and you turn this on and it, it starts spinning the magnetic bead so you can mix up your broth properly. So first, gather all your ingredients, uh, measure out, uh, you can find the, this procedure within the lab manual, all the different gram values for each of the ingredients and with the weigh boat, uh, add them to this bottle. You can find that on page 75 through 76 in the lab manual. After you add it to the bottle, um, add, add, the, add the water because you're going to be working with milliq water. Uh, typically, I think our, I think our uh, procedure calls for around 700 milliliters of milliq water. So you add that, then you add your, um, your bead, you put it on top of the stirring, you turn it on and mix it up properly. That should take around three to five minutes to mix, uh, to mix up properly. After that, you're going to prep the bottle for uh, autoclaving. Um, that includes removing the lid, because if you keep the lid on while you autoclave, it's going to pop the bottle. So replace the lid with some aluminum foil and also get some autoclave tape and put the autoclave tape, which we have in the lab, uh, on the side of the bottle or on the lid so we know if it's properly, uh, properly autoclaved. And after it's autoclaved, which uh, if, in case you're not sure what an autoclave is, an autoclave is a basically a, a gigantic pressure cooker. So you just, you throw this in the pressure cooker and once it reach, reaches uh, pressure and temp for an extended period of time, that tape will change color so you know it's properly disinfected or mixed together or dissolved. So after you pull it out of the autoclave, you're gonna let it cool so you can actually touch it. You want it cool enough so you can pick it up with your own hand, but not cool enough to where it's solidified in the bottle. If it's uh, like pure jello in the bottle, you, you are in trouble because that's going to be a pain to remove. Um, after that, you, you start, uh, after it's like liquid, but not, not too hot, you start pouring the plates, uh, which I'll get into the next slide. So um, I made an instruction manual for making LB broth, not LB agaros for plates, uh, which can be appropriated to make LB agaros plates. So the only difference between making LB broth and LB agaros is that you add a certain amount of agaros, which is found in the lab manual. Um, I highly recommend if you're unfamiliar with the procedure or some of the equipment uh, or how to use a gram scale, how to measure stuff, uh, click the link, um, go to the description of this video, uh, find the PowerPoint presentation and click this link. It will take you to a PDF document of an instruction manual that I made. Uh, it's pretty in detailed, though I did omit a few things for conciseness, like I didn't include using the autoclave tape. Just keep that in mind. Autoclave tape is not required, but it's a very useful diagnostic tool to figure out if your, your autoclaving was successful. And yeah, just don't forget, add that agarose if you're making LB agarose for plates. Uh, I do also, I do trust in your ability to measure out ingredients with an electronic scale. Um, make sure to, to, you know, weigh it out properly. Um, but for the most part in the instruction manual, I, I kind of briefly skip over that. So next, pouring plates. Um, this can be found in page 26 of the lab manual. Uh, this is a picture of a person pouring the plates. As you can see, it's right around the halfway mark. Um, so before you pour the plates, uh, while it's in the autoclave, while the, while the jar is in the autoclave, make sure to label the sleeve properly. So like I said before, uh, label with the date, with the name, and color code it. And um, make sure to disinfect the countertop you're working on. Uh, you're going to want to open and start stacking those plates uh, into stacks of around four to six, because that's what you want to work with. Um, and so what you do, I, I go to this more into, uh, I think in a later video, but uh, what you do is you you get a stack of four to six plates, you hold them in one hand, and then you slowly work your way up filling each one. So you, you open up the lid on one while the rest of the plates are in this hand, you pour, you put down the lid, uh, you do the next one, you keep on working up the stack. And that you'll, you'll work with it, uh, we'll work on it with, with lab. So um, that's typically the best way because it's the fastest and it makes sure that you don't have any air particulates going inside your plates especially if you're working with plates without antibiotic. If, it's not anti if it doesn't have an antibiotic, they're gonna be uh, very, very nutrient dense for just random bacteria and microbes in the environment to colonize those plates that you just made, which you do not want to happen. Next, you just let them cool until solid, make sure they're properly closed and stacked up. Um, keep that, that, that labeled sleeve right next to them. And uh, after they're properly cooled, you could wait half a day or come back a day later. Uh, put them into the sleeve, seal it up with tape, and then put it into the refrigerator. And make sure to keep it in the refrigerator because that keeps them uh, much better. It keeps them like, it's like food, right? Uh, you want to keep it refrigerated so mold and stuff doesn't grow on it. 
So next week, uh, I'm going to be going over bacterial transformation, and I might briefly touch into mini preps. I don't exactly remember uh, because next next video uh, it is uh, the the recordings I did throughout the previous semester. It's the the live the live uh, lab meeting sessions. So um, I might cover a little bit of mini preps, but I know it, at least eventually I start covering m uh, mini preps in these series. The mini preps, uh, what they are and how to do them. It's one of the more complicated procedures that we have. Um, but bacterial transformation is, is very good to know uh, because it's going to be the main thing that you're going to be doing in iGEM. Uh, mini preps, yeah, that's it. Uh, I guess see you next video. Uh, you're going to rewind a few months back into the past. See you then.